or societal problems equate to a cross that they have to bear in life. Maybe you've heard this way of speaking as well. And undoubtedly, this comes from our gospel lesson, especially the words which I just read, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But I think here I need to say that Jesus is not speaking of our own worldly trials and ailments and problems. At least not in this part of the text. Here Jesus is speaking of a literal wooden cross. Hewn out of a tree for the purpose of nailing a body to it and hanging it in the air to suffocate until it literally can't go on and die. Jesus speaks of persecution and a faith which would suffer all for the sake of Jesus Christ, even death itself. And we must remember this because although our earthly ailments and problems, while they're undoubtedly sinister and horrendous and terrible, tumultuous, all of these things, and we have ways of speaking of them about suffering along in this world and our sin and shame and all of these things, and we have ways of talking about them At least here in this text, Jesus is talking about suffering for his sake. And that's a completely different thing than suffering alongside ourselves in our own physical ailments. My brothers and sisters in Christ, there are thousands of people in this world who are truly bearing crosses even as I speak. And I find it strange how the world has suddenly taken note of the plight of thousands of Christians in this world who are being slaughtered by the likes of ISIS or ISIL, depending on how they name themselves. These enemies of Christ have entered the world stage via our media, social or otherwise, as they commit such atrocities as kidnapping and selling children and women into slavery, beheading infants in streets, and forcing Christians to dig their own graves just in time for their demise. And I find this all strange because these things have happened almost daily since our Lord's ascension. And we're just now paying attention to them. Maybe in our neck of the woods these atrocities are a little hard to imagine. And yet they are real. And they could indeed happen in this place. There are real crosses in this world. And our Lord reminds us all in this very reading that if we are to follow Him, we too might have to bear a rough-hewn wooden cross to our own death. It is only in this type of faith that we can be saved, a faith which really, truly does trust that Jesus Christ is Lord, a faith which trusts it so much that it will take you to your grave in faith. Lately, we've been hearing a lot about graves in faith and different funerals that we've had here, about those who have died in faith will yet see the Lord and the resurrection. On one level, this is utterly insane. I mean, how many people believe in something so much that they are just willing to die for it or die in it, especially in this day and age in our country? We might even be persuaded, I think, that 2 plus 2 equals 9 if a crazed gunman was involved. But to pick up an actual device of our murder for a man that we have never seen, And yet this is exactly what faith is. An ultimate trust in God above all things. But this is absurd to the world around us. Especially as we watch these atrocities in the Middle East. I keep hearing commentators and as I'm watching the blogs go, people are saying that you should just let it go. It's not that important. Life is so much better. Just stop believing. Just convert with these maniacs and they'll let you live. But what would it profit a man if he inherited the whole world, but forfeited his life in the same breath, Jesus says. This world, these things around us will all break down. Everything that you see around us, everything in our life will break down and fade away, you included. We will break down, we'll fade away and die. It's the nature of sin in this world. And we wonder why the world would rather have nothing to do with us. It's such a morbid outlook on life, after all. It's not happy or glorious and beautiful. We talk about death a lot. We talk about sin a lot. We talk about the only way to actually win, especially win in death, 
is to lose. And let's face it, people simply do not come in droves to anyone who insists that the only way to win is to lose. And I think this is why Peter really rebukes Jesus like he does. Peter wants the glory, the beauty, the happy. He wants the praise and a God he can set up on a pedestal and worship in his own way. And this gets Jesus to call him Satan, a scandalous one, a hindrance to his gospel. Because this is not what it is all about. It is not about a continuation of his kingdom. The gospel is about death. No, it's more than just death. It's about a murder. A murder that wasn't supposed to happen to Jesus, it was supposed to happen to you. And yet Jesus went through it for your sake, so that you could be forgiven. And this is completely contrary to the way the world around us would like to have it. Our world would rather have the glory, the beauty, the happiness. It wants to see the gospel as some sort of service organization meant to help people when they're down and out, not something that has to be believed in. It wants to see the gospel as something, some sort of new age philosophy meant to get a better life and live a better life right now. It wants to put Jesus on a pedestal as some great moral teacher that walked around in the desert some 2,000 years ago, but not as a savior, not as one to believe in. It's just insane. But I think we fall into this trap as well. It's easy to make the things of the gospel the things of Christ, the things of the church, the things that belong to Him, into our own thing and our own works for salvation. And yet that's the lie, isn't it? Because the gospel is right here in the text that we just had in our gospel reading. Let me read it again and maybe with a little bit of emphasis. The gospel is that it is necessary that Christ must suffer. There's no other way. It is necessary for Christ to be killed. There is no other way. And it is necessary for Christ to rise three days later. These are the things of God. And it's radically different from the things of the world. And it's for you. It's preached for you. Poured over you with water and word, as we'll see at the 1030 service. It's placed in your mouth with bread and wine, body and blood. It's strengthened in your faith. And it gives you that faith, that word of God, that necessity of Christ's death and resurrection for you, for your sins, for your forgiveness. Gives you the strength that even in death, we might fight the good fight. And yes, this gospel might indeed cost you your life. That is the call. It might indeed mean that you have to actually carry a real cross to your own execution. And yet the things of God are not of the things of this world, but of his kingdom. And thanks be to God. Because his kingdom is a kingdom that you and I, that are brothers and sisters in Syria and Iraq, Iran, China, North Korea, Afghanistan, you name it, all over the world, will inherit through faith, even in our death. So no, today's gospel does not require us to identify the crosses in our life. It just tells us the cost of discipleship. And I should also mention that it doesn't remind us to take up arms and defeat all these evils in the world. It says suffer along with them and follow Jesus. But in the midst of it all, it also reminds us that the rewards are literally out of this world. In the name of Jesus, amen.